Emily Carr's Clee Wick, Chapter 12, Sailing to Yan. At the appointed time, I sat on the beach waiting for the Indian. He did not come, and there was no sign of his boat. An Indian woman came down the bank carrying a heavy, not walking aged child. A slim girl of 12 was with her. She carried a paddle, and going to a light canoe that was high on the sand, she began to drag it toward the sea. The woman put the baby into the canoe, and she and the girl grunted and shunted the canoe into the water. Then they beckoned to me. Go now, said the woman. Go where? Yan. My man tell me, come take you. Go Yan. But the baby? Between Yan and Masset lay ugly waters. I could not, no, I really could not. A tippy little canoe, a woman with her arms full of a baby, and a girl child? The girl was rigging a ragged flower sack in the canoe for a sail. The pole was already placed and the rag flapped limply around it. The wind and the waves were crisp and sparkling. They were ready, waiting to bulge the sack and toss the canoe. Can you manage the canoe with the baby? I asked the woman and hung back. Pointing to the bow seat, the woman commanded, sit down. I got in and sat. The woman waded out, holding the canoe and easing it about in the sand until it was afloat. Then she got in and clamped the child between her knees. Her paddle worked without noise among the waves. The wind filled the flour sack beautifully, as if it had been a silk sail. The canoe took the water as a beaver launches himself with a silent scoot. The straight young girl with black hair and eyes and the lank print dress that clung to her childish shape held the sail rope and humored the whimsical little canoe. The sack now bulged with wind as tight as once it had bulged with flour. The woman's paddle advised the canoe just how to cut each wave. We streaked across the water and were at yawn before I remembered to be frightened. The canoe grumbled over the pebbly beach and we got out. We lit a fire on the beach and ate. The brave old totem stood solemnly round the bay. Behind them were the old houses of Yan, and behind that again was the forest. All around was a blaze of rosy pink fireweed, rioting from the rich black soil and bursting into loose, delicate blossoms, each head pointing straight to the sky. Nobody lived in Yan. Yan's people had moved to the newer village of Masset, where there was a store, an Indian agent, and a church. Sometimes Indians came over to Yan to cultivate a few patches of garden. When they went away again, the stare of the empty hollows of the totem eyes followed them across the sea as the mournful eyes of chained dogs followed their retreating masters. Just one carved face smiled in the village of Yan. It was on a low mortuary pole and was that of a man wearing a very, very high hat of honor. The grin showed his every tooth. On the pole which stood next sat a great wooden eagle. He looked down his nose with a dour expression as a big sister looks when a little sister laughs in church. The first point at the end of the Yan beach was low and covered with coarse rushes. Over it, you could see other headlands, point after point, jutting out on and on, beyond the wide sweep of Yon Beach to the edge of the world. There was lots of work for me to do in Yon. I went down the beach far away from the Indians. At first it was hot, but by, by and by, haze came creeping over the farther points, blotting them out one after the other, as if it were suddenly aware that you had been allowed to see too much. The mist came nearer and nearer till it caught Yon into its woolly whiteness. It stole my totem poles. Only the closest ones were left, and they were just gray streaks in the mist. I saw myself as a wet rag sticking up in a tub of suds. When the woolly mist began to thread and fall down in rain, I went to find the woman. She had opened one of the houses, and was sitting on the floor close to a low fire. The baby was asleep in her lap. Under her shawl, she and the child were one big heap in the half-dark of the house. The young girl hugged her knees and looked into the fire. I sat in to warm myself, and my clothes steamed. 
The fire hissed and crackled at us. I said to the woman, how old is your baby? Ten months. He not my baby. That, pointed the girl, not my child too. Whom do they belong to? Me. One woman give to me. All my childs die. I got lots, lots dead baby. My friend solely because I got no more child, so she gave me this and this for mine. Gave her children away? Didn't she love them? She loved plenty lots. She cly, cly, no eat, no sleep, cly, cly, all time cly. Then why did she give her children away? I big flen for that woman. She saw in me. She got lots more babies, so she give me this and that for me. She folded the sleeping child in her shawl and laid him down. Then she lifted up some loose boards lying on the earth floor, and there was a pit. She knelt, dipped her hand in, and pulled out an axe. Then she brought wood from the beach and chopped as many sticks as we had used for our fire. She laid them near the fire stones and put the axe in the pit and covered it again. That done, she put the fire out carefully and padlocked the door. The girl chide child guiding the little canoe with the flour sack sail slipped us back through the quiet mist to Massa.